Are you bored? No. <laughs> That's good. You, you could have said, not yet. <laughs> there is an investigation among high school students where they were asked to write down in a few words what they think about schools, what their experiences of schools were. And it turned out that the most popular answer was, school is boring. And that leads to two questions. The first question is, why is this so? Why do they think that school is so boring? And in the first part of my talk, I will give a diagnosis of the situation. And the second question is, does it have to be like that? And the answer is no. And I will, in the second part, more constructive part, I will give some ideas about how to generate uh, motivation. This is a picture from a primary school at the end of the 19th century. And as you can see, not very much has changed in the general organization of a classroom, of a lesson. The students sit in at the desks, there is a blackboard, there is a teacher. There are some superficial differences, but very much looks the same. The organization of schools has actually changed very little over time. What you don't see in the picture is, there is, is that there is a set of hidden rules that govern the lecture here. And I have um, written down some of these rules to make them explicit. So, everybody in the class shall be of roughly the same age. They shall do the same thing, independently of where they are in their learning development, independently of what talents uh, they have. Uh, they should lose, use the same learning tools. And in the traditional school, the, the prime tool has been text, textbooks. Uh, they should follow the same curriculum. There is a set program that the teacher wants the students to go through. They should be judged in the same way, examined in the same way. Uh, they should all, they give the same answer to questions. Come to think of it, this is very funny. I mean, in a school, when uh, there, there, a question is answered, it's supposed that there is a unique, correct answer to it. If you go out in reality, this almost never happens. Um, and they should be quiet and sit still, unless, of course, the, the, the te teacher addresses them. And they should concentrate, in particular, on what the um, uh, teacher is doing. These rules cannot be found in any curricula or any official descriptions. That's why I call them hidden. They are built into the system. And the teachers have to follow them, uh, more or less, uh, in order to fit into the, what the school expects out of the teachers. If you ask the kids about what they like about the rules, they say that they don't. In particular, they don't want to do the same thing as everybody else. And, and, and why should they? Is there any reason for this? And they don't want to sit still. When, when my youngest son was uh, starting his first grade, I asked him, after a couple of weeks, what, what is the main difference between school and, and preschool? And he answered, school makes my bottom hurt. <laughs> and uh, if you um, ask them about whether they want to concentrate, they don't even understand the question. I mean, if they do what they want to do, they concentrate, concentration comes, comes automatically. There is absolutely no research that supports this rule of uh, these rules of, of, of the lessons. There is nothing that says that this is the best way of uh, achieving uh, learning. They have been established more or less by tradition, and they are to some extent uh, motivated by the ideas of industrialism. I want to point out two consequences of these rules. And, and, and the first one is that not everybody fits in. The rules have been formulated from the perspective of, of, of the schools. And there are some, some students who have problems here. For instance, if you have problems with reading texts, you have problems in, in fitting into the traditional lesson here. And if you have severe problems, you are diagnosed as a dyslectic and you're given special, special treatment in the school. You're sorted out of the ordinary uh, system. And in Ken Robinson's TED talk, 
he gave the example of the girl who absolutely could not sit still. And uh, um, she later became one of Britain's most famous uh, dancers and choreographers. And she concentrated when she was moving. I mean, for her, sitting still was totally going against her, her desire on how to behave and, and how to learn. So I recommend school leaders to change the perspective and to, to focus on the individuals instead. You should ask, instead of talking about what school says about how you should behave in the class, you should ask, what, how can school adapt to make the situation the best for this particular individual? And I think we are very far from, from that situation. The second consequence, and the most important here, is that these rules block the motivation of the students. Uh, if you go outside schools, kids are not bored at all. They do what they like to do. And young children are most motivated when they are playing. And somehow there has been a division between playing and learning. Playing is for fun, learning is something serious, so you can definitely not learn by, by playing. Uh, this reminds me of the old saying that when you take a medicine, it should taste bad, otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> and the analogy is, of course, that teaching must be boring, otherwise it doesn't work. I find it difficult to see the logic of this argument. Um, it's not the teacher's fault that school blocks motivation. I mean, it's the, the, these rules are built into the system. And as a matter of fact, the teachers have to work against the, the rules. And, uh, I mean, if you're a good teacher, you still succeed in generating motivation in, in your students. If you're not so good, um, you're, you're, you will fail. The students will be, still be bored and you will lose your own motivation as a, a, as a teacher. So, the question is then, how should we restructure schools to make students more motivated? I wish I had a general answer to this question, but I don't. But I think I've identified a few factors that are useful in, in, in generating motivation in, in students. So, let's turn to these factors. I have borrowed some idea from Jerome Bruner, who is a psychologist and uh, educationalist, and he identifies three factors. The first one is quite natural, that you should build on the curiosity of the students. We as human beings are born with a very strong natural curiosity. I think I could say that along with the rats, we are the most curious animals on this, uh, on this planet. So that criterion is quite natural. The second one is maybe a bit uh, surprising. He says that having a feeling of having a control over a situation, being competent, is a very strong factor for, for, for motivation. I mean, if you solve a problem that you, that you had struggled with, and, and then suddenly you feel a sense of relief, and this is very motivating for you. And I will come back to this point, that having control is a very strong source of, of motivation. The third factor is that we are, after all, social uh, animals. We would, would like to do things together. And uh, if we can collaborate among th people we like, then this also increases uh, uh, cooperation. Um, I, when I read about these three criteria, I was thinking about, I was trying to find some systems where these criteria are well fulfilled. And I found two examples. The first example is video games. Video games build very clearly on the curiosity of the player. They build up virtual worlds that are interesting, that are fascinating. The players want to go around the corner and see what happens in the next uh, scene and, and so on. So the, the screens are made for, for curiosity. Of course, when coming to the second factor, a, a player cannot have full control over the game. Then it would be boring. There is some challenge. There is a mission that you have to fulfill. And computer games are very often built up in a series of levels. 
The first level is quite easy. You can solve it after, after a few attempts. Then you feel some kind of satisfaction. Go, you go on, to the, go on to the next level and you, you try again and after a while you succeed. And you're building up a, a sense of have, getting more and more control, having more and more competence in, in, in this game. And even if a game is a one-player game, they, in particular children, very often play a game together with somebody else. One is playing the game, there is somebody else sitting next and looking at what's going on. They talk about the game, they have an interesting chat about it. But of course, the most um, motivating games are those where you play together with somebody else. In particular, when you play in a team against some other team. That's a very motivating situation. So the computer game industry has been very successful in catching the motivation of the players. And we, we see the consequences of, of that in, in the lives of ourselves and of, our, of our, our, our children. The second system that fulfills these criteria quite well is what call, is called peer learning. And if you look at where, what children do outside school, they're very often engaged in, in peer learning. They meet their friends. They go skateboarding, they go riding horses, they uh, play tennis, they play in, in the garage band, and, and so on. And they are very often driven by an interest in the topic. They're curious about what they are doing, what, whatever the topic is. And in the group, in the peer group, there are some who are good and some are not so good. And the ones who are the experts in the area, they get, get the very high status in the group. They're, and they have a feeling of competence and they are motivated. And very often, they are willing to help the, the children in the group who are not so good to, to teach them about what, how to solve a particular problem, how to do, how to do this trick, and, or how to play this chord on the guitar, or, or whatever is, in, in, is going on here. Um, so it's very much based on getting more and more control over, over an area. And more or less, by definition, um, um, peer learning is a cooperative game. So peer learning is a system that works very well as, as a motivating system. And I think I can recommend teachers and school leaders to introduce more aspects of peer learning in, in the schools. I think that would be one way of, of uh, increasing the motivation of, uh, of, of the students. And the next factor is understanding. When you get an aha experience, you get a kind of feeling of relief. When you have struggled with a problem where you haven't, haven't seen the solution, you, you are, are stressed. And, and uh, when you suddenly see the solution, you have a feeling of relief. And this is very motivating. And this motivating f f thing makes you want to go on and, and learn more, and try to understand more. So the question is, why, what is going on here? Well, I think that one factor is that when you understand something, you feel that you're able to solve new problems. You, you, you can see the, the, the pattern, you can know what to do next, and, and so on, and that gives you a feeling of competence, that gives you a feeling of control. So the mechanism I want to point out here is that understanding generates control. And as we saw earlier, control is something that is motivating. So there is an indirect link here. But it's also very important to point out the other direction. If you don't understand, you become very frustrated. And if you're frustrated, your motivation goes down very, very quickly. And therefore, in a schooling situation, it's very important that the teacher can, understand, can see whether a student understands what's going on in the classroom or not, and help the student to, uh, to, to go on. Okay. One more factor is, I can borrow from Hattie, John Hattie's book on visible learning. And, and John Hattie, he has done a Herculean task of uh, investigating a large number of studies of uh, educational interventions. I mean, he's gone through more than 800 meta-analyses of uh, a lot of studies, and they're actually based on more than 50,000 individual studies of uh, educational interventions, and in, in total more than 200 million students are involved in this. So it has been really, really a big task. And what he finds, he looks at a large number of factors, more than 100 factors, 
of, of different aspects of school. I mean, the organization of school, the education of teachers and uh, individual uh, features and, and so on. And one thing he finds is that factors concerning school structure, that is, um, how big the classes are and where they're located and so on, have indeed a very small effect on the outcomes. And he's trying to measure the outcome of each of the factors. What he finds is that among the most important factors is the feedback that the teacher gives to the student. That turns out to be, I mean, of course, there are factors that the teacher cannot control, but uh, among the factors that are within what the teachers can do, the feedback to the students is the one that has the greatest effect, effect on the uh, education outcomes. And let's see how Hattie defines feedback. This is his definition. Feedback consists in providing information how and why the student understands and misunderstands and what the directions the student must take to improve. So, again, this is connected to helping the student to understand. And then we get yet another uh, element in the link uh, here. The final factor I want to introduce is metacognition. And metacognition concerns um, how you reflect upon your own thinking and, and your own learning. I can th maybe think that I'm, I'm good at reading texts, but I'm not so good at, at using my body and, and, and solving problems. Or I can say that I'm good at drawing, but I have problems with re reading texts. Or I can think about what have, what have I learned in school last week. Or I can think about why did the teacher present the material in this or that way. When I'm reflecting upon my, my own learning process, so to speak. And it turns out that introducing this kind of reflection will support learning. It, learning uh, results will be better if you introduce this metacognition in the, uh, in, in the classroom. If you give the students uh, information about what are the teaching goals and, uh, and so on, and they, and they can reflect on whether they like it or, or not and so on. We don't really know why metacognition supports learning. But my diagnosis here is that metacognition is part of generating the control over the situation. You feel you know that where you're going in school and why you're doing something. So that is one factor that gives you some kind of control over your learning. And thereby you, you again, generate um, motivation. If I go back to John Hattie's book, he calls it visible learning, and he, he uh, says that visible learning is teachers seeing learning through the eyes of the students, and then the students looking at the uh, uh, teacher and trying to find out what, what, is, what is going on here. And I hope you see that this is one kind of metacognition, the teachers reflecting upon the students' learning and, and, and vice versa. So, again, I, I see a... a um, uh, connection between the factors that teach, uh, Hattie point out and the factors I have identified as a uh, model here. So, this is my final diagram where I present all the links that lead to motivation. And as you can see, there are many roads to motivation. Thank you very much. <coughs>